On the morning of October 1st, 2004, a badly decomposed body was found at the Salt Lake County landfill. By afternoon, the body had been identified as that of 27-year-old Lori Hacking, bringing a close to the three-month search for the 27-year-old pregnant wife. In July, when her distraught husband had begged for her safe return, no one could have seen this end coming. But the investigation into what happened to her in the early hours of July 19, 2004 would uncover an intricate web of lies and how far one man was willing to go to keep anyone from ever finding out his secret. On a trip to Lake Powell in 1994, Lori met fellow high schooler Mark Hacking. Sparks flew from the moment they met, and the two were inseparable. Three years later, the high school sweethearts tied the knot. They were young and deeply in love. Neighbors often saw them running together, and occasionally, Mark would be seen heading home with a bouquet of flowers. Lori's mother told everyone who would listen that she couldn't have asked for a better son-in-law. Five years into the marriage, Lori was pregnant and happily told her parents. The news came with mixed emotions. They were excited to be grandparents, but Lori and Mark were also preparing to move across the country to Chapel Hill, North Carolina. In preparation for the move, the couple had a lot of their possessions boxed up and ready to go. Lori had also put in her resignation from her job at Wells Fargo, where she worked as a trading assistant. That Friday, the office got her a farewell cake. It read, We'll miss you, Lori. They had no idea how true those words would turn out to be. By 9 a.m. on July 19, 2004, Lori had not yet resumed at her desk in the Salt Lake City office. This was highly unusual for Lori, and her colleagues were a little worried. Their worry turned alarming when Mark called asking to talk to her. When they told him that she wasn't there, Mark called her friends one by one, but none of them knew where she was. Finally, at 10 a.m., Mark called the Salt Lake City Police Dispatch and reported her missing. Lori, he said, had not come home since she took her three-mile jog through Memory Grove Park and City Creek Canyon at 5.30 that morning. Mark said he had gone to the park to search for her and found her car parked at the entrance, but there was no sign of Lori. The police said she needed to have been missing for 24 hours before they could even begin searching for her. However, Lori's friends and families were not willing to wait that long. They swept through the area, calling out for her. By the next day, the family was on TV begging for information on anyone who had seen Lori anywhere. Missing posters started to go up around town as friends flew in from all parts of the country to lend their support. Soon, the story of the pregnant woman who had disappeared into thin air was making headlines all over, especially because of the similarities between her disappearance and that of a 14-year-old girl who went missing in June 2002 and wasn't found for nine long months. Within days, the search team went from 200 volunteers to over 1,000. Mark spoke at a press conference pleading for his wife's safe return, but the strain of her disappearance must have gotten to him because later that night, he was found running around a hotel located half a mile from the apartment he shared with Lori, stark naked, except for a pair of shoes. His family immediately checked him into the psychiatric unit of the university hospital. The entire community felt sorry for him, but not everyone. Top on the list was the Salt Lake City Police. In fact, they had their suspicions about the grieving husband's actions. He was psychotic enough to strip naked, but not enough to go out barefooted. They were sure that it was just a ploy to garner sympathy and divert scrutiny. This was because the investigators had found out some information about Mark that they were sure his family members didn't know about, but it was only a matter of time. They were right. Mark's family seemed to be learning new details about him daily. It started with the small things, like his smoking habit. A store clerk identified Mark as a regular who bought cigarettes and begged him not to tell his wife. Before they were finished, she turned around and told me, don't tell my wife I smoke. Then it got bigger. Mark's family learned that though Mark studied psychology from the spring of 1999 through to the fall of 2002, there was no record that he had ever graduated. They also learned that his acceptance into medical school was a hoax. Mark had never even applied. It came as a shock to Mark's father. He had been to their home recently and seen everything boxed up ready for the big move to North Carolina. Mark had also hired a moving company and asked his father to help tow their second vehicle to North Carolina on moving day. Lori had even resigned. Could Lori have found out the truth and walked away? The family couldn't help but wonder. 
Salt Lake City investigators were pursuing a different angle in their search for Lori. From day one, the police had circled back to the couple's apartment to find any clues that would lead them to Lori's whereabouts. But what they found raised more questions than answers. A letter found in a spare bedroom allegedly written by Lori, a bloody knife found in the bedside drawer in the couple's bedroom, and a new box spring mattress and beddings. The receipt for the mattress showed that Mark had gone shopping for it the morning Lori disappeared. The police got search warrants and took a lot of items from the house for further examination. Searches around the neighborhood revealed many items of interest, like a bloodied trash bin and a cut-up mattress that matched the couple's box spring. In a trash bin near the University of Utah Hospital, where Mark worked, they found a clump of dark hair in a dumpster outside. They also collected surveillance videotapes from a hospital, a Mormon church located near the park where she disappeared, as well as a convenience store to help track her movements on the day she disappeared. But instead of finding Lori on the tapes, they saw Mike. Between 9.45 and 10.23 a.m., on the day Lori went missing, he was buying the new queen-size mattress at a local bedding store instead of running through the park searching for Lori like he had claimed. There was also the little matter of her car. Lori's car had been located near the park where the seat had been moved all the way back, like you would if you were a much larger person. Lori was only 5'3 and 115 pounds. There was no way she adjusted the car seat. In addition, the police had found the keys to the car back at the couple's apartment. If she had driven the car to the park to jog, as Mark had said, the key should have been with her when she disappeared or left behind in the car. The only way they could have made it back home was if someone took them there, leading the police to question if Lori ever made it to the canyon at all, and their one person of interest was Mark. They weren't the only ones thinking that way. On July 24th, two of Mark's older brothers, Lance and Scott, went to visit him at the university's hospital psychiatric ward. It was not a cordial visit. Rumors had started going around town that Mark might have had something to do with Lori's disappearance. Even though Mark and Lori's parents tried to address Mark's lies and get the search focused back on Lori, the number of volunteers went down from over 1,000 to 150. They gave Mark the afternoon to think over telling them what had happened to Lori. At 11 p.m., the two returned. It was then that Mark made a shocking admission. Lori had not gone on a run or been kidnapped. He had murdered her. The horrified brothers were too shocked to know what to do with the information. At first, they thought it was another lie. After all, just two days earlier, Mark had looked his father in the eye and denied having a hand in her disappearance. There was also the little thing about him having a psychotic breakdown. Could he just be saying what they wanted to hear? Even so, the following night, the family made a decision and informed the police and Lori's parents about what Mark had said. On July 31st, two weeks after Lori's disappearance, the 1,800 volunteers searching for Lori and hoping for her safe return for two long weeks were informed that Mark had confessed to her murder. The search was called off and a search to recover her body began. A few hours after Mark tossed his wife's body in the dumpster, it had been taken to the Salt Lake County landfill. A volunteer team of police officers, firefighters, public safety officials, and urban search and rescue team members together with cadaver dogs and backhoes began searching for her body amongst the thousands of tons of garbage. They spent an average 11 hours a day, four days a week, digging through the trash, sometimes by hand. The search at the landfill was supposed to last about a month, but when they hadn't yet found her body, the prosecution decided to build a case without it. They had Mark's confession to his brothers and the material evidence they had gathered. Lori's blood had come back a match to the blood that had been found on her car, on her bed's headboard, mattress, and railing, as well as the blood that was found on the bedroom carpet and the knife found in the kitchen. There was also a letter Lori had written just days before her death. It read like she was speaking from the grave. She wrote, I hate coming home from work because it hurts to be home in our apartment. I can't imagine life with you if things don't change. In addition, investigators had uncovered a number of surveillance videos that picked Mark at different times around the time Lori was murdered. One clip showed Mark at a convenience store buying cigarettes at 1 a.m. Another clip showed Mark disposing of something in a dumpster and then driving Lori's car towards the park. On August 2nd, 2004, 
Mark was moved from the psychiatric hospital to the county jail where he was charged with first-degree felony murder and three counts of obstruction of justice. His bail was set at a million dollars. Shortly after, a memorial service was held in Lori's memory. Over 600 people attended the service with Mark's father saying the opening prayer. Then, on October 1st, 2004, a police sergeant sifting through the landfill came across a bag. Like he had done a hundred times already, he pulled trash out of it. But this time, he watched in shock as tendrils of hair came out. He took a closer look at the bag and saw a jawbone with teeth inside. The area was quickly enclosed as they gathered more remains. They also found a bloodied carpet. The body was badly decomposed, but using dental records, the police would confirm that they had found Lori hacking. Unfortunately, the medical examiners were not able to determine her cause of death. The gun that was used to end her life was also never recovered. But why would this dedicated husband murder his wife in cold blood? Two of Mark's older brothers were high achievers, and Mark's father said he must have felt pressure to excel as well. But rather than put in the work, he chose deception. And the more lies he told, the more he had to make to cover it up. Mark had lied about going to college twice. The first time in 2000, his mother had found out and left a voicemail asking him why he was not enrolled. Lori had heard the voicemail first. When she confronted Mark, he took off in his car. She eventually found him at a hotel an hour away. Mark had claimed he was stressed with work and forgot to register. He promised to register and Lori believed him. But Mark had not enrolled. He never did. At work, he kept up the facade and would go to a small computer room at the institute to write term papers. He also pretended to go to classes and would speak of difficult courses. He even produced test scripts with red correction marks in the margins. When the graduation ceremony came around, Mark sent out foil-embossed invitations. But on D-Day, he was conveniently ill and couldn't make it and told his family not to bother going either. The following week, Mark produced a diploma. One time, he took a flight to Manhattan and pretended to attend an interview at medical school. He even stayed with a cousin who drove him to and from the interview. When they got back to her home, Mark gave her details about how the interview went and what questions were asked. But when Mark claimed to have been accepted into the medical school in North Carolina, his lies began to unravel. On Friday, July 26th, Lori contacted the University of North Carolina Medical School to find out about what financial aid they could get since she was pregnant, only to learn that Mark was not enrolled there. Co-workers remembered seeing Lori in tears as she left work early that Friday to confront Mark. Whatever reason Mark told her worked because around 5 p.m., Lori left a voicemail at the school explaining that her husband had told her the reason why he was not enrolled was because of a computer malfunction. Later that night, the couple went to her supervisor's mountain cabin for a party. No one noticed anything strange between the two. On their way back home, they stopped at a convenience store. The clerk said that while Lori appeared to be happy, Lori was not. The footage was the last time Lori would be seen alive. Later that night, Mark said he confessed to Lori that it was all lies. He had not been admitted into medical school and there was nothing for them in North Carolina. Whatever response Lori gave was not what Mark wanted to hear. While she went to bed, he stayed up playing Nintendo games. Later on, he was packing some more moving boxes when he came across a loaded 22 caliber rifle. At around 1 a.m., Mark crept into the bedroom where Lori was lying fast sleeping and shot her in the head. Then he wrapped her body up in a carpet put her in garbage cans, and threw her into a dumpster near the University Neuropsychiatric Institute. When he returned home, Mark got a kitchen knife and cut away the top of the now-blooded mattress, taking it to a church trash bin. On his way back, he tossed the gun in another dumpster. By morning, Mark went to buy a new mattress and left Lori's car at the canyon to cover his tracks. The news that Mark had murdered Lori came as a shock to her parents, who had loved Mark as if he was their own. They had even stood by him when the news of his lies and deception started making rounds. But they were in for more surprises as Mark entered a not guilty plea at his arraignment. But at his trial the following year, Mark pleaded guilty to the murder charge and confessed to murdering Lori. The family hoped he would be sentenced to life in prison. However, he was sentenced to six years to life. When the news broke, there was outrage that this murderer could be out of jail in as little as six years. The community was relieved when a year later, the Utah Board of Pardons and Parole held a quick hearing for Mark and told him he wouldn't get another consideration for parole until 2035, after he has served a minimum of 30 years. On Lori's gravestone, one name is missing. It's the surname Hacking. For Lori's mother, 
A man who discarded the mother of his unborn child and wife in a literal dump did not deserve to have his name written on her gravestone. The gravestone now reads, Lori K. Sores, Filhina, a Portuguese word for little daughter, which is how they will always remember her.